Welcome to Mastering VMware's vSphere 6. We're doing with chapter 11, Managing Resource Allocation. So this is always a good chapter because when we talk about virtualization, we're normally talking about several VMs on a physical machine, whether it be centrally or decentrally managed. The interesting part is, how do you manage the resources of that physical machine to all of the VMs? And that's a big part of what virtualization really is all about. So, there are limits to how many VMs can run on a specific physical server. And we have to understand things like memory, processor, disk, whether it be local disks or a data store on a SAN, centralized storage type disk. And lastly, network. You have to understand all four, because all four of these are critical to understanding the way that VMs are stored and processed on a machine. The nice thing is things like processor, uh, things like memory, you can always do what's called ballooning and you can over allocate. Uh, disk space, same thing, you can over allocate, but it gets to a point where you have finite amount of resources. For example, you may have a hundred gig hard disk. Well, in reality, you can only store a hundred gigs. You may allocate, you know, 500 gigs, but once each of the things that are using that data store start consuming more and more space, you only have 100 gigs. So with over allocation, you do have some problems. So a big part of this actually deals with how we manage our resource allocation. So we can do this several different ways. We can do it where it's unlimited. And that's how it is by default. Or you can do things like reservations, limits, or shares. Reservation acts as a guarantee of a particular resource. So you may balloon where you uh, go outside of it. For example, we may have a 12 core processor and we allocate 16 cores. Well, if everything is using every core, we don't have enough, but we're gambling or we're betting on not everything is going to use all resources at 100% all of the time. So what we can do is we can make reservations for key VMs so that it's guaranteed to have those resources. You can limit, which that is restrict the amount of a given resource that a VM can use. So even though you may give it a three gigahertz processor, you may limit it to one gigahertz. You can also do what's called share. And share is established priority during periods of contention. Basically, when you're running low on resources, share is a way to prioritize uh, what resources may get used first. Memory reservations. This is going to be uh, typically how much memory you assign to a VM and how much of that memory that you assign to that VM are you going to reserve, basically guarantee to a particular VM? Normally, I don't see a lot of people reserving VM uh, resources for VMs. Typically, a lot of deployments, they just leave this default, but you can set it. Again, a reservation is a guaranteed amount of resource that you configure on the reservation settings. Here's an example. You may allocate four gigs. You may reserve one gig. For example, you can use up to four gigs, but regardless of how much you're actually using, it's always gonna have one gig reserved for you. Memory limits. New VMs created without a limit, which means they can initiate RAM on, that you assign to it during creation. It affects limits. It sets the actual limit on how much physical RAM can be used by that VM. They are enforced without any guest operating system awareness. So you need to consider memory limits as a temporary stopgap measure when you're running low on memory and you need to reduce physical memory usage on a physical machine. Because again, you have a finite amount of memory. Because what I ran into in the past is I had a server with about 70 gigs of memory. I had several VMs running on it. And then 
again, we overallocate because we assume that none of the VMs are really going to use all of the memory that's in them because, again, most of them have lots of idle memory that's just is sitting there. So there are ways to control how much memory you need on a physical machine, keeping in mind that there is ballooning. VMware actually has a calculator on their website that does allow you to kind of see what you'd be allocating for your VMs and how much memory you'd actually need on one of your, one of your ESXi hosts based off of the projected load, and they give you all the calculations that you would need. So let's talk more about this memory sharing. So memory sharing is a way for us to share memory. A proportional shared system that allows you to assign resource priorities, but shares are used only when the ESXi host has experienced physical RAM contention. Basically, it's a way for you to share RAM space. So when they view that the same tasks are being stored in memory, let's say you're doing it based off of three ES or three VMs, instead of having memory dedicated for those three VMs, they may share uh, a portion of that memory based off of how much is like. So when the memory is scarce, ESXi must decide which VMs should be given access to certain memory, and that's where the share allocation goes in. When there's about 2,000 hosts, it's 50-50. When it's 3,000, it's, again, two-thirds versus a third. And when it's 4,000 plus, 1,500, 1,500, and 1,000. So again, depending on uh, how many VMs that you have running, will base, it'll be based off of that. Even though it's really funny is, their example of 2,000 shared alloc uh, allocated resources, that's a VM with 1,000 shares. Or thousands of VMs. I, don't, I haven't really seen that large of a deployment where we're talking thousands of machines. I, it's possible, but even... And I normally deal with medium-sized organizations, and even with that, we're talking... 20 VMs, uh, sometimes 40, if that. So it just kind of depends. So let's talk about managing the memory allocation because there's different ways that ESXi employs different uh, management techniques to help conserve memory. Idle memory tax, transparent page sharing, ballooning, memory compression, and swapping. Swapping is very similar to like page swapping. Idle memory tax inside each guest OS, VMware tools use its balloon driver to understand which memory blocks are allocated but idle, meaning uh, where they can be used elsewhere. Transparent page sharing, TPS, looks for identical memory pages that can be shared. Again, that's going to be more like the sharing. This is turned off by default, but is still a feature that you can Turn on. Ballooning. Once VMware tools is installed, balloon drivers can respond to commands from ESXi to reclaim memory from guest OSs. The balloon process is the overallocation of memory. But again, you may allocate 8 gigs of memory to a VM that's only really using 2. Why should they have all 8 gigs? If it's not reserved for them, VMware can actually deflate how much memory it's given them. So it can always reflate up to that 8 gigs, but if it only needs 2, then it will only give it 2. Memory compression. This is uh, where ESXi gets to the point where swapping is necessary. The VM kernel will attempt to compress memory pages, keep them in RAM, but try to compress, the, uh, compress them. Lastly is swapping. In the event that none of the previous described uh, can happen, ESXi hosts will be forced to use hypervisor swapping. That's where the hypervisor swapping means that ESXi is going to swap memory to disk, just like a page file in Windows. Let's talk about the speed of RAM and how this plays into the speeds of things. So RAM access time is 10 nanoseconds.
and SSD seek time is about 50 microseconds. A magnetic disk is about 8 milliseconds. An SSD, normally you take your in seconds and divide it again by the appropriate uh, multiplier. So it's about 50, an SSD is 50,000 times slower than RAM. A magnetic disk is about 100,000, or sorry, 800,000 times slower than RAM. Because we're going to do 10 nanoseconds, and we're going to divide the appropriate seek time of the disk by our nanoseconds. 500 microseconds divided by 10 nanoseconds is at 0 0.0005 divided by 0 0000001. That's why it's 50,000 50, times slower. That's how the math works out. Let's point out that one more time. 10 nanoseconds, 500 microseconds, 8 milliseconds, 10 nanoseconds. That will give us the appropriate speeds of our SSD and our magnetic disk so we can compare them to RAM. When a new VM is created with a, a single v a virtual CPU, normally that virtual CPU is going to be the same speed as a, a core. So it doesn't tie it specifically to a core, but it allows it the full utilization of any specific core. So we have shares, we have reservations, we have limits, but we also have a, an additional option called affinity. Normally used for CPU, we have the thing called CPU affinity. So what is CPU affinity? It allows you to statically associate a VM to a specific physical CPU core. CPU aff affinity, you don't normally use. It's not really recommended. Lots of drawbacks. No vMotion, no DRS. It's kind of crappy. But you can, you can manually tie it to a specific core if you wanted to. Getting into more of the, the meat of this, it's about resource management and managing the specific resource pools. So VM resource allocation, memory, processor, you can do limits and shares. These are methods that modify or control how the resources are distributed to individual VMs or VApps on each individual ESXi hosts. Just like assigning permissions to groups, you can leverage resource pools to make allocation resources to collections of VMs so you, this becomes less tedious. You can do groups and then you assign permissions to groups. Same thing here, you can do groups of VMs and you'd assign the appropriate resource pools to those VMs. The VM resource allocation, sorry, apparently I didn't click next, is very handy, but it has drawbacks. There are typically two resource pools with different shared values, which you can allocate resources proportional to their percentage of their share relationship. So what the hell does that actually mean? Basically, you can assign percentages. For example, we may have 80% of our production VMs to uh, our uh, shared levels. Basically, that will guarantee that 80% of our host portion of our CPU will be assigned to our specific group that we assign it to. Here, we're assigning it to our production VMs. The remaining portion will go to the other groups or the other pools. You can actually make that even more finite by doing specific VMs. So we may actually have dedicated VMs with specific shares. And depending on how we set the shares, we can actually allocate more processor or less processor based off of the amount of shares per VM. Moving on is managing resource allocation.
as it relates to things like the network and I.O. So we have resource pools, a network resource pool, which allows us to control and prioritize uh, network traffic and network utilization. So using the network resource pool, you can assign shares and limits. You can control ingress and egress for traffic. It is a way to shape traffic if you wanted to, uh, depending on the appropriate licensing that allowed you to actually control incoming and outgoing and the appropriate traffic shaping incoming and outgoing mechanisms. The network input output controls, sometimes called NOC, has nine predefined network resource pools, fault tolerance, management, NFS, VMs, virtual SAN, iSCSI, vMotion, vSphere data protection, vSphere replication. So we have predefined resource pools that we can auto assign. Uh, iSCSI traffic, normally I assign that to my vSwitches that are dealing with iSCSI traffic. If I'm dealing with fault tolerance or vMotion, I have, again, I have predefined resource pools that I can assign my virtual switches so that I can make sure those resources are going to be utilized appropriately. System pools versus user defined pools. You can always create your own pools, but system defined pools use reservations, limits, and shares correctly. User defined pools only make use of reservations. So we lose out on limits and shares because of the predefined system pools. They are sub allocations of virtual machine traffic network resource pools. And you can again define the reservations based off of our requirements. You can always use the define, but system defined pools are a little bit better. They utilize more features. So how can we set up the network input output controls? We can actually enable our network input output controls on our virtual distributed switches. They have to be distributed switches. This allows us to create and configure the appropriate network resource pools as necessary. The VDSs, virtual distributed switches, is version set to 5.5 or higher, and the NOC is turned on by default once you turn on the virtual distributed switches. Again, you cannot do this in a standard virtual switch. You have to do a virtual distributed switch. So moving on, we can talk about the network resource pools. They typically have three basic settings, shares, reservations, and limits, just like other pools, like shares for our CPU and RAM, they, uh, they prioritize access to specific resources when there is contention. The physical adapter shares a network resource pool, establishes that priority, and based off of that priority, they will allow or not allow connections or maybe disallow specific connections when there was none uh, previously existing. Reservations. They guarantee the specific amount of bandwidth, normally in megabits per second. Limits, you can set maximums and minimums, typically maximums, to uh, for bandwidth. Normally it's set to unlimited, but you can actually set them. So you can also regulate the storage IU utilization controlling both memory and processor, relatively easy. Network and storage utilization with hypervisors are becoming more visible. The workload external to vSphere and cannot be controlled or influenced in this way. Therefore, we have to have a way to completely control over that resource. That's where we can start controlling the input-output IOs going to those resources. vSphere can use latency and peak throughput metrics to help kind of gauge store utilization. Storage I.O. control 
and able must be managed under a single vCenter instance, meaning storage is done on a per vCenter instance. So if you have multi uh, vCenter environments, this is going to be per vCenter instance. The storage IO controls does support VM the VM file system data stores. This is both via fiber channel and iSCSI and NFF, but raw disk mappings, RDM, is currently not supported. Normally, data stores have to have only a single extent, but again, I've seen that played with where it's not always necessary. So storage input output controls, if we're looking at a data store, and we're looking at the relative objects, we can actually see the IOPS input output processes, and normally they are set to unlimited. The storage input output controls provide two mechanisms for controlling the use of storage by IO, and again, that's gonna be shared and limit, no longer allowing reservation for storage. This operates the exact same way as all the other resources. That's actually the end of chapter 11. I want to thank you.